Dana Denho here, and this is Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Every year, talented artists from all over the world aim to take part in our local film fest. Artists across all mediums utilize their skills to create films and performances to make their mark on this internationally renowned annual event. Joining me is artist Chris Riley, whose work runs the gamut of arts of many forms. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Dana. Great to be here. So first, why don't you talk about your background and what kind of led you to the arts? Sure, um, that's a big question. So, uh, well, my, my training, you know, I, I went to art school um, for, for college and graduate school. So my training mostly revolved around media arts, um, which I got into initially doing photography. So as you know, a high school student, I was really into photography uh, and was able to pursue that, um, you know, sort of outside of school. That kind of led me to thinking like, you know, I would really love to learn more about how creative thinking works. You know, it's, I, I didn't have much exposure to the arts before going to art school. So I really felt like I wanted to kind of dive in and get more exposure to, to those ways of working and thinking. So um, I went to the School of the Art, Intu art Institute of Chicago uh, for my undergrad and you know, there really got into photography, which led me into working digitally, which led me into uh, working with um, games and performance. Uh, so really, a, a, it was such a great time, a really good introduction to, to all those ways of working uh, and then Later on, um, you know, after after working uh, in the real world for a while, uh, decided I, I was, you know, I still wanted even more, uh, you know, wanted to be a more serious artist, wanted to kind of um, really pursue uh, academic teaching and, uh, you know, have a have a job where I could have a good chunk of space, you know, to maintain an artistic practice, to to be connected with other artists, um, and really just have that be like my whole main focus. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I went to the Media Arts uh, MFA program at UCLA, which was a really fantastic program, and uh, got to work with some really amazing um, artists and designers and architects, so really interdisciplinary. Um, and that, that kind of uh, really echoes in the way that I work. It's, it's really all over the place. You know, I'm working with um, sculpture, I'm working with games, I'm making software, I'm performing with musicians, I'm making installations and, and films and videos and animations, so it's kind of all over the place. So do you find that your uh, friendships and work with other artists is really helping you kind of open your mind to the work you're creating? Absolutely, yeah, and some of the best uh, experiences that I've had have been collaborations. So, um, you know, and that, that likewise runs the gamut from doing design projects, from uh, doing kind of very intimate sort of interpersonal performance with, you know, uh, partners or with friends um, to working with larger groups, uh, kind of doing group participatory performances. Um, yeah, and it's really, you know, I think the, one of the great things about being an artist is I, I have this weird kind of way of seeing things that, that uh, leads me to, to connections and developments that maybe other people wouldn't see. Um, that can be really great, but then when I can get someone else's perspective, it can like really blow my mind, uh, you know, to, to be exposed to someone else's version of that. Mm -hmm. So you were, last year you had a performance-esque sort of piece on uh, the Ann Arbor Film Festival's Off the Screen series. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So um, I think that was my second uh, time doing Off the Screen. Uh, so that was a performance uh, along with two musicians um, and w we're a group together called Liminal Luminal. So uh, I work with um, a bassist, Betsy Sukup, and a uh, percussionist, uh, Matthew Daher, and they're both, you know, classically trained musicians, very, very skilled and talented, and they're really into this way of um, playing music called free improvisation. So it's kind of, it's like beyond jazz even. So no standards at all, just completely free and open, um, you know, kind of like actively listening to each other and playing music, you know, in whatever way they feel mm -hmm. is appropriate. So uh, I've been really lucky to work with them and to do, um, sort of like a visual component to those free improvisations. So I've been, over the last couple of years, uh, building these software tools to do live video projection uh, to kind of generate visual patterns that would go along with uh, what, the, what the music might sound like um, and kind of crafting those in a way where they're, they're as responsive as a musical instrument would be. So I'm sort of like playing a, a visual instrument along with the musicians who are playing musical instruments. That actually wasn't your first foray into the film festival either, was it? That's right, yeah. So um, I think it might have been two years ago, I had another off-the-screen series um, that was a video installation 
um, of some work that I did with uh, a former partner. We would do these sort of like double self-portraits um, with video and with sort of these um, special body-mounted cameras that we would build together. Uh, so that was another really nice exposure to, um, you know, th that, that was my first time working with the, the Ann Arbor Film Fest because that was shortly after I moved here. So really nice exposure to the Film Fest in general, but especially to the off-screen series, which I think I'm really excited about that aspect, especially of, of the film festival. Well, yeah, I think the off the screen series is so interesting because when I talk to different people that have been involved in it, it's almost like you're saying like they're making like the software or like the engineering to create these things themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe like the first time anyone's seen anything like it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really exciting. Um, there are, you know, filmmakers and media art practitioners coming from all over the world doing really special things. Uh, and I think it's really fantastic that the film festival is, is you know, uh, really putting its weight behind the off-screen series just as much as the, the cinematic screenings because, you know, I think it, it's a really great compliment. They're great compliments to each other. Um, and I think it really reflects this, this, you know, kind of a big sea change in the way that a lot of artists are working now where they're, they are pulling in all these other different elements. You know, they're, they're fabricating things themselves. They're writing software. They're bringing in performance. They're kind of doing things that maybe wouldn't be able to exist in, in any other space. So do you kind of see, think that's like just the future of where artistry is going at this point? I think so. Um, and part of that, I think, is maybe um, a little bit technologically determined. You know, it's, it's much easier to get all the gear that you might need to do these sorts of things. Um, there's a lot more literacy in terms of making software, in terms of um, using a lot of the commercial packages that are out there. Uh, but I think there's also just like, you know, there's a dialogue and an excitement between artists that, that really is starting to um, break out of, of a lot of the categories that you know maybe in the past have been a little more rigid, which to me is really exciting. Well, you actually teach at EMU. Mm -hmm. So are, are you seeing the way um, teaching is kind of evolving Absolutely. with it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so um, I teach in the School of Art and Design at Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti, which is the next town over from us in Ann Arbor. Um, and absolutely. Yeah, and that's that's kind of we're we're actually going through a big change like that right now, where we're sort of um, taking a, taking a, a curriculum that was you know very pigeonholed. You had your sculpture, yeah, painting, exactly <laughs> yeah. right, and those were very different tracks. Um, and and now I think it's so much more natural uh, to see the overlaps between those areas. So you know, it's like we have tons of sculpture students who are working with video. Um, you know, we have fiber students who are also doing performance. So. Uh, I think from the student point of view, it's totally natural that those things would come together. Um, and so, so that's been really exciting to kind of be there over the last five years or so, um, help to push some of those changes, you know, and kind of be someone who's practicing in that way and, and able to sort of show students like, yeah, this is kind of how it is in the real world. It's like, you might have studied sculpture and that's great. Like that's a, that's a fantastic specialty, but you know, you get out there in the studio and like the world is your oyster. You can, you can start pulling in all these different things. And it's like, to me, that's the most exciting thing about being an artist is it's kind of like anything goes. Well, and I think with uh, the ability to kind of move from place to place, it gives you the abil ability to have more success in the field of art because mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think, you know, you always hear about struggling artists and stuff like that. So yeah. it just kind of opens doors for you. For sure. Yeah. And I think that's been my experience. I've been able to meet so many great people and have many opportunities that I think probably wouldn't have come if I was, you know, if I had felt more confined and felt like, oh, well, I'm not, you know, a qualified photographer. Or I'm not a qualified, you know, filmmaker, so I can't do these things. Um, so, yeah, I think it, to, to me, I've seen it lead to a lot more diversity, a lot more exciting, uh, you know, new connections that maybe wouldn't otherwise have formed. Well, and when I think about when I was in, I went to Wayne State and I was got my BFA from there, but it was like you did, you know, you had to take a painting class, you had to sure. take a graphic design class and sure. stuff, but they didn't really mix together. Mm -hmm. So now it's mm -hmm. you're seeing it kind of mix together. So I did appreciate that about, you know, getting a BFA that you were learning like a variety of things, but mm -hmm. then it was like mm -hmm. sometimes you'd be learning it and then it's like, then it's just gone forever and you were never really going to do anything with it again. Yeah, it was sitting on the shelf. Um, and, you know, I think uh, I've, I've had similar experiences where, right, it, it, it is maybe not until the, the second or third time that I'm exposed to something that, I, that it finally clicks. And I'm like, oh, here's how this could come along, you know, into a sculpture or here's how I could combine this with, you know, 
um, a, a phone app or some some you know uh, computer software uh, and really come have it come together in a in a really interesting symbiosis that again like couldn't happen separately. Yeah. So um, to me, I think that's that's kind of more argument for exposing students to lots of different things, exposing artists to lots of different things, just kind of like mixing things together because that's that's sort of uh, you know the soup in a good way of <laughs> yeah <laughs> of creativity. Well, you use, and you kind of mentioned it before, you use like gaming and software and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you bring gaming into it? Sure. I mean, uh, to me, I think it has a really strong tie to performance. So um, a lot of the artwork that I do is participatory, where I'm asking people to sort of um, encounter it in a, in a certain way or to uh, use their actions to activate it. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, always a lot about sort of like what is motivating people, what's their incentive to do something, um, how can I sort of prompt someone in a very, in an interesting, engaging way uh, to sort of move through an artwork um, without having to sort of necessarily like force them to, you know, sit them down and, and yeah. sort of steer them through it. Um, so a lot of that is a natural tie uh, to studying games and to um, thinking about the way that people make choices basically. Uh, I've also been lucky enough to, you know, I worked as a, a game designer for a couple of years in Chicago um, and at the media arts program at UCLA, they have a really fantastic game lab. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very experimentally driven game lab, um, which, which has some commercial ties, but, you know, in the scope of uh, graduate programs working with um, video games and analog games, it's, it's way out there in a really good way. So. Um, that was a really great exposure to lots of other people who were working with games and making these just really weird and interesting uh, <laughs> premises for games. Uh, you know, making sort of like custom controllers, making um, objects that would be uh, used in games. So again, that's a place where I saw all these different worlds kind of colliding mm -hmm. in a really great way. So it's like there were people making sculptures that, that would then go on to be used in games or people making costumes. Um, you know, there were people uh, doing sound recording and, you know, video production that would sort of then get used in other games. So it's, a, you know, again, a really great uh, diverse set of practices um, and applied in a way that to me is really new to, you mm -hmm. know, to, to sort of ask people um, to be a key component in, in activating an artwork rather than just kind of like sitting back and, and taking it in yeah. uh, is really exciting. Well, the other thing that I've been hearing a little bit more about, too, is, um, you know, everyone's virtual reality, like using virtual reality these days. But now sure. it's like becoming like people are trying to make virtual reality more of like an art form. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. do you kind of see your work going in that direction at all? Or I don't. No. Um, <laughs> and nothing against virtual reality. Uh, to me, it's a little bit, um, I think maybe there are other more elegant ways to get at some of the things that virtual reality is doing. Or, or uh, you know, I think the most interesting um, virtual reality pieces that I've seen, those they just kind of like aren't up my alley in terms of the, the ones that have been like really beautiful and aesthetically amazing. You know, it's just not necessarily things that I'm interested in producing as an artist, mm -hmm. which, which is fine. But um, yeah, to me, I think um, one of the things that I really dislike about virtual reality is that the, the physical um, apparatus is like, it's very much designed for an individual. Yeah. So yeah. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in as an artist is, you know, uh, well, a few things, relationships, you know, perception, um, how people navigate communities. And that's something that I feel can kind of be best explored when people are sort of together in a space, even though, you know, it's like we could both be wearing virtual reality helmets and it could be programmed so that we're together. Yeah. But um, to me, there's just these kind of, there, there's some kind of like big, um, underlying premises that are built into that hardware that I don't really d agree with. So to me, it's just not my cup of tea. Yeah, okay. Well, why don't we check out some of your work? Great. Now that we know about Chris's background in the arts, let's watch his film, Self-Portrait in Reykjavik. <laughs>
We're back with Chris Riley, and we just watched his film, Self-Portrait in Reykjavik. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about the film and what kind of got you the ball rolling to make this film? Sure. So um, this was a piece I started working on um, during an artist residency in Reykjavik in Iceland uh, at the Association of Icelandic Visual Artists. Really great residency program there. Uh, so I was there for two months in the um, spring and summer of 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a really amazing experience. Um, part of you know the way that the film came out was really driven by just the, the literal physical experience of being there uh, around the summer solstice when you know you have 24 hours of sunlight. Uh, so it's hardly ever dark. Um, so it was you know a couple months for me of just kind of being awake all the time. You couldn't get used to it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it was a <laughs> it was a little bit of a love hate relationship. I think in some ways it's it's. I mean, it's so beautiful, amazingly beautiful, uh, really energizing. Um, so you know, you don't, you just don't have the same sort of rhythms of like sleep and awake. It's just kind of almost always awake. And even when you do feel tired, you're just like you get up and you like you walk by the window and it's broad daylight. You know, at 3 a.m. So you're like, all right, time to get back to work. Yeah. Um, so it, it, in some ways, was great because I got so much done. You know, I was like, it. it spun me a little bit manic. I think. Well, and you figured you're like, okay, I'm only here for two months, yeah. so yeah. get it in while I can. Absolutely, absolutely. So really great way to, to you know, um, be very productive artistically. Uh, at the same time, you know, um, for me personally, uh, it, it was kind of a, a difficult time in my life, you know, dealing with a lot of um, heavy personal emotions, dealing with depression, dealing with uh, some complex relationship issues. Um, so that along with, you know, the sleep and wake cycle disruption, I think really, uh, gave me a, a pretty, uh, frenetic feeling, I think, uh, almost the whole time that I was there. And I think I was able to kind of like channel that into a lot of the way that the film feels to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of like, um, distortion and flickering and quick on and off. Uh, you know, um, kind of like a little bit irritating sounds, things like that. Um, so to me, it, it ended up being like a very accurate sort of like psychological self-portrait of like, okay, here's where I'm at uh, dealing, dealing with all of these things and being awake, you know, kind of 24-7. Um, on the technical side, I was also, you know, so like I went out to this residency, really excited to explore some new techniques. So. Um, I was yeah, so tell me a little bit about the residency and how it kind of came about and sure. why you were there. Sure. So um, as, as part of my job as an arts professor, uh, you know, I'm uh, required to do art research. So a lot of times that means just working my studio or being in exhibitions. But another thing that sort of counts towards that is going to art residencies. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, um, you know, for someone who hasn't been to a, a residency, it's a little bit like uh, post school school. So, you, you know, a bunch of artists come. Uh, live in a space together, usually their studio space, and they're just kind of hanging out, uh, working on whatever projects they want, you know, for maybe a month, maybe two months, sometimes mm -hmm. longer. Um, and so I'd uh, gotten recommended to this one specifically by a colleague uh, who had been there several times and spoke very highly of it. And um, it was really nice. They're very supportive. Uh, it was very open-ended in terms of what we were supposed to produce. Um, they gave us an exhibition space, so we had a couple of exhibitions of the artwork that was made there. But other than that, it's just kind of like, here's space, here's support for doing the things that you're interested in. And uh, the proposal that I had made to come there was to work on some new photographic techniques that I was interested in. So, um, you know, I was, I was trained as a photographer, and I've always been really interested in kind of like alternative process. Uh, sort of um, especially dealing with custom optics, um, dealing with uh, custom software that can process photos. Um, so I was doing a couple different uh, variations on that. One is called uh, photogrammetry. So that's where you're taking a bunch of photographs and kind of stitching them together in software okay. to actually make like a three-dimensional object. Yeah. So I was sort of taking these like photo photogrammetry uh, self-portraits of myself uh, and using those in different ways. Um, I was also really interested in trying to capture photographs that didn't have perspective distortion. So it's like a super nerdy uh, kind of like art school thing of, of, you know, sort of like how do you render a body? It, does it have perspe perspective distortion where things sort of appear smaller as they mm -hmm. get farther away? Or do you render it, you know, where everything is in proportion all the time? Um, so to me, kind of, kind of trying to bend photography like that in a way that it really isn't 
sort of meant to, to go is, mm -hmm. was a really interesting uh, project. And then uh, the last one was doing some video software where I was sort of taking live video feeds of myself and like processing those in real time and kind of responding to things like motion or things like um, the, the colors of, of my skin or my, uh, you know, my attire. Mm -hmm. So which of these processes, or maybe you used all of them to kind of create this film? Yep, all of them. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the, the, the last one was also uh, was really fun. So the, the residency itself is like right on the ocean. So it's, you know, maybe 100 yards uh, from the ocean. So you have this amazing, beautiful kind of like panoramic view out the studio window. Uh, and because, you know, Iceland is an island, Reykjavik's a big port city, there's just constant ship traffic all the time. So um, I was doing some, uh, also some computer vision photography where I was, you know, setting up a, a video feed and using software to, to track the ships, basically. Mm -hmm. So kind of like isolating the ships from the background uh, and kind of taking those clips and, and then using them almost like a collage, you know, in the film. So yeah, all of that stuff is, is in there. Yeah. Um, so again, it was, you know, in, in that kind of idea of it being like a very manic state, I'm just like, I'm setting up all this stuff and I'm gonna like dice it all together and, and we'll see what happens. Of those things, mm -hmm. what did you find to be the most challenging of them? Oh man, um, I mean, I think the the things where I'm uh, sort of physically showing myself are, in some ways, the most technically challenging. But then also, kind of like um, conceptually, or you know, just in terms of like vulnerability, are definitely the most challenging. Do you, is this like one of the first times you're really using yourself in your work or is that a no, typical thing for you? that's a typical you? thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a question of degree, but I, I could probably make the argument that like every single thing that I've made is a self-portrait in, in some rights. Um, this is obviously on the end of the spectrum where it's like more of a literal, you know, uh, physical self-portrait. Um, it was also uh, a challenge in that some of the things I really ended up needing a lot of help, which I wasn't quite prepared uh, to, to set up. But luckily, you know, through some of the relationships that I built with the other artists there, I was able to kind of convince them to help me with some of these setups where, so, you know, um, there's a shot of me kind of like laying down. So that was, you know, me literally like laying down for like an hour while they, you know, came and like took probably like a hundred photographs of yeah. me. And then we used the software to kind of stitch it together. So. Um, yeah, weirdly, the technical stuff it was was fine for me, and that, or that's the thing that I'm good at, just like sort of you know figuring out. It's so the vulnerability. It's the softer stuff that's definitely more of a challenge. For yeah, sure. yeah. Do you find that um, there, you get a nice reaction from you know your fans that when they're watching a self portrait mm -hmm. of someone? Because I feel like sometimes when you think about art and like people creating self portraits, it's like, is it really just for the artist or is it for the it's a viewer? Gazing. Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, the responses that I've got have been pretty positive. I'm sure some people probably feel like that, which is like, why should I watch this? But, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I think I do believe that, you know, the, the old saw that it's like in the, in the specific is the universal. So, you know, um, I could imagine someone seeing this work and even just relating to the general feeling of like, this feels kind of crazy, right? Very I can definitely yeah. feel your emotions when I'm watching it. Yeah, yeah, and that's great. And I feel like that's kind of the goal is that for me, it's like I said, it, that, that, that's a, it's a very accurate rendition of sort of like what it felt to be, to be there physically and emotionally for me at the time. Well, I think it just takes some sort of art appreciation. I'm, I mm -hmm, have no mm -hmm, problem with mm -hmm. people making self-portrait work, but I'm just wondering, like, you know, just someone sure. that's not completely into art, just thinking about, like, oh, what does this mean to me? Or maybe more of a traditionalist. Sure. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think um, I, I, could, I could probably steer a skeptic uh, yeah. toward, towards being more open to it by just thinking, like, think about how often, you know, how much time during your day do you spend looking at other people? How much time do you spend looking at pictures of other people? You know, I think if you're if you're kind of like you know someone living around here who's probably on social media, like you're probably seeing like hundreds of faces every single yeah. day. So you're already kind of like in that mode, whether you realize yeah. it or not. Um, it, it, it's not too big of a jump to take you know to to go from there and say, well, let's look at one that's maybe like a little bit weirder or one that's like a little bit longer, and maybe it's going to make you feel like a little bit more a little bit less comfortable than mm -hmm. you would looking at like your Instagram feed. But um, maybe there's a value to, to that sort of a thing. And maybe um, there are, 
some things that you could learn, some things that could help you sort of like grow or make new connections through that uncomfortability. Well, and I think that's kind of what the Ann Arbor Film Festival is all about. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I think they're, uh, another thing that I really appreciate so much about the way that the festival runs is um, like the little feedback sheets that you get after, uh, after the screenings, just, uh, just asking like, what did you see? Um, and a lot of the outreach that they do in terms of uh, kind of coaching people a little bit through like how to watch and appreciate experimental film, I think is so nice and, and really something that uh, I feel is like really welcoming to folks who might not have that background, who might not have had you know, the advantage of, of taking an experimental film class and having someone like walk you through and be like, here's why it's actually interesting versus just sort of like sitting in a theater being like, what the, what what the heck is, is this? this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. For more on this and other CTN series online, visit a2gov.org slash watch CTN. I'm Dana Denhofer. Let's watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Mm -hmm.